A lot of questions were asked when the enigmatic Knight of Skeleton made his first appearance in Berserk. Is he an apostle like Zod? How does he know all this information about Guts in his birth? Was he there? And perhaps most important of all, is he a human being with skeletal armor, or worse, an ethereal skeleton wearing human-esque armor? A lot of these questions have been answered by the manga since Skull Knight's introduction all the way back in Chapter 37 of Berserk, but if you're someone who has only seen the anime or isn't familiar with Berserk at all, then you're probably wondering why all this hype around what's basically an old Hollywood horror trope. Well, as you'll learn over the course of this video, the Skull Knight is far removed from anything of that sort, and it all starts with his anatomy. This is Skull Knight's anatomy explored. Is Skull Knight a human being? How does his first appearance explain what he is? You'd be forgiven for thinking that Skull Knight is some sort of human being because out of all the astral creatures we see in Berserk, he's the one that appears and behaves most human-like. But make no mistake, fellow strugglers, the Skull Knight is about as inhuman as the foes he faces. The biggest hint confirming this, apart from the fact that he literally disappears after dropping knowledge on Guts's head, is that he tends to appear only near a temporal junction point or on nights with a full moon. This is actually shown to us in the first couple of panels of Chapter 37, which opens with a shot of the full moon hiding behind clouds, shining its ominous light down on the now-alone Guts following his departure from the Band of the Falcon. The other and more obvious hint revealing Skull Knight's astral nature is the reaction Guts has to his presence, and basically everything else that occurs in Chapter 37. As the lone swordsman ruminates on his decision to leave what he thinks might have been irreplaceable comrades, the warmth of his campfire is undercut by a sinister presence. Guts grabs his two-handed greatsword and gets ready to cut down whatever it is that he senses, but he has a sense of panic about him that is quite different from the still water calmness he displayed against Griffith in just the previous chapter. Guts' guard is all the way up, which usually means instant death for anything that enters his radius of attack. Even a fly would find it difficult to evade his grasp, yet now, Guts misreads his would-be attacker's presence not once, but twice, swinging his sword around like that six-year-old who didn't know his elbow from his butt during training sessions with Gambino. But what's more astounding is his open admission of fearing for his own life. Usually, Guts is so composed in the face of death that it unnerves anyone trying to kill him. If the enemy is a flesh and blood human, Guts has a 100% chance of cutting them down, which is reaffirmed when he defeats Griffith in Chapter 36, the only man that ever defeated him twice. But when Guts went up against Nosferatu Zod in the opening stages of the Golden Age arc, he realized that the upper cap on his killing potential at the time was restricted to humans. That's because Zod made him realize that there are things in this world that a mere human being can never hope to kill. Guts managed to give the Immortal One the best fight he had had in three centuries, but all he really managed to do was slice off Zod's arms multiple times, which he can simply reattach to their stumps and insta-heal anyways. The encounter opens Guts' eyes to the presence of Inhumans in this world, and that uncanny, heavy feeling of bloodlust that oozed out of Zod's entire being was what Guts was being reminded of in Chapter 37. The unease gave way to confusion when he saw that it wasn't the Black Lion of Doom creeping up on him this time, it was something else entirely. The Skull Knight manifested out of the cold night air like a corpse coming out of an inky black grave, and we call him a corpse because, well, he looks like one. As we mentioned at the beginning of this section, you'd be forgiven for thinking that Skull Knight was a human in skeletal armor, because at first glance, that's exactly what he looks like. The first shot might have made him look like a corpse, but when we get the full reveal, we see that he looks more like the man in skeleton armor. Sitting astride a majestic black warhorse decked out in armor, the Skull Knight lives up to his namesake. His entire suit of armor was reshaped to resemble a human skeleton. The breastplate was fashioned after a rib cage. The gauntlets and greaves looked like femurs and radius and ulna is covered with sinewy flesh. Where there wasn't a skeletal motif going on, like with the Skull Knight's pauldrons and thigh guards, there were jagged spikes that looked like bones. And then we have the whole reason the fandom calls him the Skull Knight in the first place, his iconic skull-like helmet but it's that same infernal skull mitt that reveals the truth of Skull Knight's existence. Now, usually, when you see someone donning a helm with an elaborate visor, it's pretty difficult to make out the look in their eyes because they're so covered. Despite being shaped like wide-eyed sockets, Skull Knight's visor openings show no semblance of human eyes. Instead, they're two glowing red balls of rage that actually look pretty similar to an apostle's in their released state. This is how we definitely know that the Skull Knight is an astral creature, and not just a human warrior residing within the interstice. Well, that and the fact that he gives Guts a warning and then just disappears into thin air. But you know what we mean. Skull Knight is not a human being. And if you still have any doubts, you won't in a moment. How old is the Skull Knight? 
How is this possible? After warning Guts about the onset of the eclipse, we don't see Skull Knight for an entire year because, well, that's when the eclipse was going to occur. The eclipse ritual, the incarnation ritual, and most other God Hand orchestrated demonic advents are temporal junction points. This is why the Skull Knight makes multiple appearances around such events, irrespective of whether there's a full moon in the sky or not, though there usually is. He saves Rickert from being eaten alongside the half of the Band of the Falcon that did not go to save Griffith. After a few days, he shows up in front of Rickert once again who, as the sole survivor of the attack, thought that reaching their decided rendezvous point would be a good next move. If only he knew that his life was never going to be the same. As Rickert got closer to the ethereal tornado that housed the Eclipse Interstice, he noticed that two figures he recognized were fighting right outside of it. One of them was the seemingly immortal god of the battlefield, the Apostle Nosferatu Zod, and the other was the guy that saved Rickert from becoming dinner for demons, the Skull Knight. As Rickert wonders why these two were duking it out in front of a magical storm, the scene shifts to the fighters, and this is where we learn a rather shocking fact about Skull Knight's age. Up until this point in the story, the oldest characters we saw were the God Hand, barring Griffith and Zod himself. During Griffith's ritual, Void revealed that the last eclipse happened 216 years ago, which means that the youngest God Hand member is at least 216 years old, and the oldest is about a thousand. Before that, we were told that Zod is at least 300 years old by none other than the man himself. Turns out the Skull Knight is about as old as the oldest God Hand member because he's been fighting those Inhumans for a thousand years. He's fought Zod in his 300 year existence so many times that they now have a respectable rivalry with one another and even go so far as to calling each other old friend on occasion. That's not to say they won't start a fight to the death the instant they're in the vicinity of one another, but they respect each other enough to hold off on fighting to see the bigger picture unfold a couple of times. But this raises the question, how can Skull Knight have possibly lived this long? We get what happened with the God Hand because they're profound astral beings that usually exist in a space where time functions differently. We get Zod living 300 years because technically, as long as you don't absolutely butcher an apostle, it keeps on living. And there is no one on this planet who can butcher the immortal one. But how does Skull Knight do it? Every other good aligned character we see in the series that has an unnaturally long life has taken advantage of their astral environment to do so. Flora, Granny Volba, Gedfring, and the rest of the great gurus of Elfhelm have presumably lived for centuries. Flora was banished from Elfhelm a long time ago, and Volba and the rest of the gurus are old enough to remember that day. The reason she was able to live as long as she did probably had more to do with the interstitial nature of her spirit mansion tree than the taboo that she was accused of violating, though Flora herself often says that she has lived way past her time, so maybe there is some meat on the bones of those accusations. Volba and the rest live on the island of Elfhelm which itself is a spiritual anchor of the world, meaning the concept of time works differently there when compared to the physical world. In fact, Gedfring happens to have known Skull Knight since his own youth, which means that he knew him before he became Skull Knight. But what does all of this have to do with his age and how he still manages to exist in the world? To put it in one word, everything. If you've seen any of our Berserk videos, and we recommend that you go through our dedicated playlist on Berserk if you haven't, you'll know that we at Marvelous Anime wholeheartedly believe that the Skull Knight is nothing more than the continued existence of Supreme King Geyseric. The fact that Zod calls him the God Hand's thousand-year-old enemy some 30 chapters after we learn of Midland's history and Geyseric's role in it was the first giveaway. But there were some other early signs as well. For starters, Skull Knight's battle armor has one peculiar feature you won't find on any skeleton. And no, we're not talking about his Legion of Doom-inspired shoulder gear. His Skull Helm has a tiny crown that looks like jagged spikes jutting out of his temple. Skull Knight first appears in Chapter 37, and King Geyseric is first mentioned in Chapter 53, which also happens to be titled Thousand Year Fiefdom. Talk about layered storytelling, huh? We honestly don't get how people still refuse to make the correlation, but we'll leave that to discussion for the comments. In that chapter, Charlotte explains to the Griffith rescue team the history of Midland. And when she talks about Geyseric and his reputation, Guts initially thinks of Griffith, but eventually realizes this guy sounds more like Skull Knight. And it all comes down to the fact that Geyseric donned a skull-shaped warhelm during his time, which earned him nicknames like the Skull King and the King of Galloping Death. Now, Gedfring knew Skull Knight when he was Geyseric, and so did the man who was partly responsible for his current existence as a wandering wraith, the dwarf blacksmith, Hanar. The Skull Knight often refers to himself as a wandering wraith and when we look at what that description means, we tend to agree with him. A wraith is another term for a ghost or a spirit, usually a malevolent one, which only appears in front of certain people under certain conditions. The Skull Knight only appears on a full moon or near temporal junctions to either warn Guts or fight the God Hand. It's usually one or the other. 
But a wraith is generally thought to be incorporeal, so how can the Skull Knight's actions affect the physical world? Sure, you can argue that the spirits of the undead in Berserk have a heavy, slime-like quality to them based on the description Guts gives us. But you have to remember, Guts is a man with one foot in the physical world and one foot in the astral world, now that he has the Brand of Sacrifice. If you want to learn more about how that works, check out our video breaking down the Brand of Sacrifice in detail on our channel. But the Skull Knight is a completely astral creature and should technically not be able to affect Jack in the physical world. So how does he do it? It all comes down to Hanar. Before he became Skull Knight, Geyseric had a close relationship with the inhabitants of Elfhelm, which is evident in their treatment of him. This includes Hanar, who is a master blacksmith and also the creator of the Berserker armor. Once Geyseric's physical body perished, Hanar bound his soul to the skeletal armor we see him using as a body in his current existence as Skull Knight. He was probably also the person that gave him his trademark horse with its traditional gothic drip. It's thanks to a combination of this ultra-durable armor and his current status as an astral spirit that Skull Knight has been able to survive for such a long time. When he's not fighting the God Hand, he's traversing the astral world looking for ways to fight them. And as we have already established in this section, time just works different in that world. This is how Skull Knight has managed to live for over a millennium, fighting in humans and looking for a person who can struggle alongside him against the immovable tide of causality. But speaking of causality, how can Skull Knight see the flow of causality? The concept of causality in Berserk is one that dictates the lives of every character in the series, even powerful beings like the God Hand. As a matter of fact, it is such a profoundly intrinsic concept to existence itself that only supreme astral beings like the God Hand can perceive its flow. The concept of causality is ultimately controlled by the entity known as the Idea of Evil, which functions as the only known god of the Berserkverse and the puppeteer of each character's individual and collective fates, be they physical or astral. The God Hand directly receives their power from the Idea, which is how they are able to foresee things down to minute details, at least for the most part. The God Hand is not omniscient, and their calculations regarding causality's flow can be disrupted by unforeseen elements like Skull Knight, but they're the most accurate of the bunch when it comes to seeing and interpreting the flow of causality. But fortune telling is not an ability unique to the God Hand in Berserk. There are many other characters in the series that can lift the veil of time and peer into things that are yet to come. Of course, as most things in life, there are levels to this game. The most basic fortune tellers in Berserk use your crystal balls, your star alignments, and your requisite occult incantations to discern the future of an individual or scenario. We see this occur when that old fortune teller looks into Rickert's future and sees the eclipse staring right back at her as the young falcon makes his way to the rendezvous point. Then there are more advanced users of Arcana that can determine what's to come using similar methods as well as their own experience in the field, like Flora, who predicted the arrival of Guts's group as part of her disciple Shirke's journey as well as her own. Griffith's medium Sonia is a prodigious seer who sometimes turns into an oracle without her own knowledge and spits out prophecies that are 100% accurate. Even Zod has been shown to be able to perceive the role causality wants people to play in a situation, because as soon as he sees Griffith's Crimson Behlet in his first encounter with Guts and Co, he is able to deduce not only what will happen, but when it will happen, and how it will happen, and what Guts' connection to Griffith is defined as by Griffith without his own knowledge. This kind of foresight is extremely unique for an apostle, and while Zod's own personality has a lot to do with it, we have to think that a fair amount of it also comes down to him just spending centuries as an astral creature. Sufficient exposure to any kind of environment will eventually lead to acclimatization, and after spending a thousand years wandering both worlds, Skull Knight most likely knows enough about the astral world to now be able to discern its inner workings. The Wandering Wraith often shows up to give Guts prophetic warnings about things to come, but his wording is so specific that it's like he's read these things in a book somewhere. In his first encounter with Guts, he warns the lone swordsman that he's about to enter a torrent of madness and death from which there will be no escape for a human. This echoes the sentiments expressed by Nosferatu Zod as well, where the Immortal One told Guts, when Griffith decides they're no longer friends, an inescapable death will pay him a visit. But before Skull Knight departs, he mumbles something to himself. He says, in the abyss of despair, only he who stands with broken sword in hand. Perhaps, and then the inner dialogue abruptly ends as he vanishes into the night. Thing is, while Zod was convinced Guts would die in the Eclipse, it looks like Skull Knight only made it seem that way to him. 
Before parting ways with him, Skull Knight christens Guts with the name Struggler and charges him with contending and wriggling his way through the Eclipse. The reason Guts has lived this long is because he was born at Death's Door, which is exactly how he excels at escaping it. Skull Knight knows about the grim circumstances surrounding Guts' birth, and remember what he said to himself under his breath before leaving Guts? That's exactly what occurs during the Eclipse. As his comrades are killed and devoured by the apostles gathered for their twisted feast, Guts alone struggles and contends resolving to kill them all and live. He fights until the bitter end and is forced to witness the newly born Femto violate the love of his life. In that abyss of despair, Guts shatters his sword trying to free himself from Borkoff's jaws, and he ends up surviving a certain death scenario against all odds. Skull Knight not only predicted what would happen, he also predicted what Guts would look like in that moment, and to top it all off, he only breaks into the Eclipse to rescue him and Casca after Guts breaks his sword. As you read the manga, which you should if you haven't, you will realize that Skull Knight often precisely describes what is about to happen in his prophetic mumblings. Following the conclusion of the Golden Age arc, Miura spends considerable time building up to the next important demonic ritual of Berserk, the Incarnation Ceremony. Once again, we'd recommend you check out our playlist to find out more about this frankly sickening ritual, but getting back to it, Miura-sensei spent at least a good 20 chapters setting up symbolism, actions, and subtext for the Incarnation Ceremony. The dream of the Falcon of Light, the Kushan invasion, the mass spreading of plague in Midland, Zod's subconscious defeat to Griffith, Farnese meeting up with Mosgus, Isidro being thrown into the mix like one of his namesake stones, it's a lot of setup with not a lot of clarification. That is, of course, until Skull Knight shows up in chapter 142 and flat out explains what's about to go down. He clearly states that when the blind sheep, desiring the Falcon of Light, walk together at the blood-soaked holy ground, and Guts and Casca step foot on it, the incarnation ceremony will begin. With Casca already in St. Albion, the gears had already begun to turn, and Skull Knight takes his clear-cut interpretation of causality a step further by explaining that nothing they did in the physical world could stop the incarnation ceremony entirely. When Guts fires back by pointing out his own survival as being against causality's original plan, Skull Knight acknowledges him as the leaping fish that can breach the flow of causality, but points out the reasons for the same as well. As a branded individual, and so far the only one in known history to survive their sacrificial ceremony, Guts resides in two places at once. He can affect both through his actions, however minute they might be, and Skull Knight does acknowledge this, but in the end, he does warn Guts that things won't be as simple as he thinks they'll be, and he is always right. But what does all of this have to do with his anatomy? Well, as we stated earlier in this segment, it's thanks to his existence as a profound astral entity that Skull Knight can even perceive the flow of causality in the first place. And we know he can do this because he often talks of it as though he does, which is generally a dead giveaway in fiction. Had he still been King Geisrich, he would not have been able to foresee things to this extent, let alone affect them hundreds of years down the line. So the next time you see this guy spout off at the mouth, talking about some new dead sun darkening the horizon, you better listen, because he has far more hits than misses. And speaking of anatomies, hits and misses, let's get to what you really came here for. What makes Skull Knight one of Berserk's deadliest characters? There is absolutely no doubt that the Skull Knight is one of the most lethal beings in all of Berserk, and a lot of it has to do with his anatomy. As a spirit bound to an enchanted armor, Skull Knight enjoys functional immortality from all sorts of physical attacks. How can you cut something that isn't technically there in the first place? It would be like trying to kill Alphonse Elric from Full Metal Alchemist without removing his blood root. Alphonse is a character with a similar existence to Skull Knight. His soul ended up getting bound to a suit of armor due to a botched alchemical ritual, which sent his real body to the other side of the gate. While this made him functionally immortal as well, because once again, how do you defeat an empty suit of armor, Alphonse's mobility and existence were limited in ways different to Skull Knight's. For starters, he always existed within the physical world of his own story, which means he can't just magically melt into the shadows every time he's faced with a challenge he can't overcome. Alphonse has to fight out everything every day, not just on full moons, and his new body comes with its own set of problems, like getting disassembled or, we can't believe we're actually saying this, but possible rusting. Skull Knight doesn't face these issues, not because he mostly resides in the astral world, but because so far, literally no one has even laid a sword slash on him, let alone a finger. What makes Skull Knight far deadlier than Alphonse or any other reanimated spirit in skeletal armor is his lethal approach to battle and the blinding speed to back it up. Skull Knight used to be the ruler of the entire continent upon which mankind resides, and he won that realm for himself with blood not gold. Over the course of his millennium-long existence, he has fought and killed more apostles than he can even count, and he does it with a grace that makes Guts look like an amateur in front of him. 
What makes the Skull Knight so deadly is the fact that once he gets into the zone, he's an unstoppable killing machine. When Skull Knight breaches the Eclipse, he is able to fire off a strike in the direction of Void, deflect it due to his spatial chicanery, mow through multiple apostles like a lawnmower cutting through grass, rescue Guts and Casca, and all of this while dodging Femto's attempts at using his newfound powers effectively. All of this occurs within a matter of seconds, and it's not like Skull Knight was just bisecting apostles on his way to Guts and Casca either. He was dicing them up and slicing through their flesh as if he was going to use it for his own meals, and the speed of his sword strokes combined with how clean they are reflect just how lethal he can be in a true battle. The fact that Skull Knight and Zod have fought each other multiple times for 300 years and neither has died is impressive enough, but we have to give Skull Knight the point here for being more impressive in every encounter they have in the series. SK has left the Immortal One eating his dust. Skull Knight is also the only person in the series besides Guts who chooses to attack God Hand members head on, and he isn't half crazy like Guts, which probably makes him worse now that we think about it. Now, you can say that a lot of this comes down to his equestrian companion who does all the heavy lifting for him, but handling a horse in the middle of a battle is stressful enough for most fighters already, and the way Skull Knight rides his steed, he'd give Sir Locus the Moonlight Knight a massive inferiority complex. Being an astral entity, Skull Knight can sort of bend the rules of reality, and this of course extends to his horse, who has been shown to be able to not only move at the speed of lightning, but it's also capable of flying should the requirement ever arise. This makes Skull Knight's range of movements endless, and when you consider what we've already told you about the surgical precision with which he approaches a fight, you start to understand why even the strongest modern apostle can only force a stalemate with him. We've seen this guy Spider-Man gallop his horse down the side of the Tower of Conviction to fight an apostle shaped like a behelet, whom he manages to mortally wound in a split-second encounter. Heck, we don't even see Skull Knight and Zod go at it properly when the latter's war demons attack Flora's mansion and Grunbeld still wants a piece of him. Considering the Flame Dragon Knight's obsession with fighting honorable fights with strong opponents, we can't think of a higher compliment than him dismissing Guts in the middle of their fight in favor of wanting a crack at Skull Knight. If push came to shove, SK could have probably soloed every demon that showed up that day, bar Zod and Grunbel, but even them he likely could have taken on with Flora in her new daemon form. We do see him solo an endless horde of ogres and trolls when he shows up in Clip Off to stop Slan's forced advent, and considering even Berserker Guts hasn't shown that level of swiftness and endurance so far, we have to give Skull Knight the title of the strongest Berserk character, at least on the good side. The part where Skull Knight becomes truly broken is with his sword of actuation, but it also raises a question about his physiology that many fans still might not have an answer to. Does Skull Knight eat behelets to increase his powers? Is this the key to defeating the God Hand? For a very long time, Berserk fans were confused by what appeared to be a rather quirky character trait of Skull Knight's, which was first observed in the aftermath of the Lost Children arc. As he surveyed the aftermath of the battle between Guts and Rosine, Skull Knight noted that it seemed as if Hellfire had scorched the land itself. He wondered whether Guts was even a human being anymore if this was the scale his battles were occurring at now, which is when his attention is caught by what he was looking for. Nestled in the stump of a blackened tree was a behelet, the very same behelet Rosine had used to become an apostle. Skull Knight pulled it out, and at first, we thought he was probably going to hold on to it for safekeeping, to prevent others from befalling a terrible fate as well. But then he did something completely unexpected. Skull Knight ate the behelet, in the middle of giving a rather serious inner monologue filled with concern towards the direction in which Guts and the world were headed in, Skull Knight just swallows the egg-like fetish whole, and it was a moment of unexpected brevity for us. We didn't think that this armor-bound soul needed nutrition to survive, as his rage and vengeance should have been enough. The reason Skull Knight continues to vie against the God Hand is because it's literally all he knows how to do anymore. When he was still a human being, Skull Knight, as King Geiseric, had used the Berserker armor. In fact, it was because of his use of the armor that he had such a black reputation in the world, because as we know with Guts' usage of it, the armor turns men into feral beasts. The Berserker armor's visor takes on the shape its user gives to their own inner malice, which is why Guts looks like a rabid armored wolverine in it. But this is also why it had a skull-shaped helmet when it was first introduced. It's because the Skull Knight was its last user. Now, the way the Berserker armor works is, the Ode imbued within it will constantly try to take over your own life force by exploiting your rage and malice. Once you synchronize with it, it will give you limit-breaking physical performance and keep you fighting until all your enemies are dead, but at the cost of your own life. The Berserker armor doesn't fix its user's incurred damage like most fantasy armors, it simply negates the pain stemming from it. The user still has to deal with the repercussions of trying to pull off moves that a normal person simply can't, and the armor literally eats into their flesh the more they rely on it, 
until they die fighting. This is exactly what happens to Skull Knight in his Geyseric days, as he dies fighting against Void and the prototype God Hand, which we learn in Chapter 362. After this, his soul likely turns into a daemon like Flora's, and because the last thing it experienced was a deep-seated resentment for the God Hand and a desire for revenge, that is exactly what has become Skull Knight's life now. He can remember people from his day, but not as clearly as he would like, and never with the same emotion. The only emotions he feels are rage and vindictiveness, with a hint of a sense of protection towards the human race as a whole. But it's because he is now essentially a wandering wraith that the Behelet eating question becomes relevant. Does it give him a power boost? In Chainsaw Man, any devils that eat pieces of other, stronger devils end up becoming many times more powerful than their base existence. For example, after devouring just one bullet of the Gun Devil's flesh, the Eternity Devil was able to trap Makama's Special Division 4 in a hotel for several days, whereas it would have failed to do so without that power amp. In the manga, a character called Santa Claus becomes a near primordial devil herself after eating a piece of the Darkness Devil's flesh. And at this stage in the story, we have to assume that everyone is out for Denji's heart for more Lecter-esque reasons than they want to admit. In Jujutsu Kaisen, Yuji eating Sukuna's finger imbued with his cursed energy is what awakened his latent instincts as a sorcerer. With each finger he ate, the risk of Sukuna rampaging increased, but so did Yuji's base powers. Going by this same logic, it would make sense to think that eating Behelitz would make the Skull Knight stronger, but things are never as simple as they appear in Berserk. For starters, a Behelit is a living object. For most of the time, it appears like an inanimate egg-shaped rock with unnerving design choices. But when the right time comes, the Behelit becomes the catalyst for a human being's descent into demon kind. Behelits often end up back in the world even after being used, and it is the Behelit that acts as a conduit for a demonic ritual, as the idea of evil sends it into the world primed with that purpose. So even if it had some inherent powers of its own, eating the Behelit wouldn't do anything for Skull Knight. And besides, he doesn't eat the Behelits he ingests so much as he stores them in the gut of his armor. Why, you ask? Well, this is where he gets what you might consider a power-up. Turns out, Eating Rosine's Behelet wasn't a one-time thing. Skull Knight does it every time he comes across one. At a certain point in the story, he feels like a Behelet disposal unit almost, and he doesn't forget to eat the egg of the Perfect World's Behelet before trying to help Guts out with the events of the Incarnation Ceremony. After we reached Flora's mansion, we had to ask why Skull Knight was swallowing these rock eggs like Kronos, which is when we learned that he was actually reshaping them into perhaps the only weapon with a chance at killing the God Hand, the Sword of Actuation. By ingesting and processing the Behelets within himself, Skull Knight has refined them into a mass of goo that he can coat on his regular sword whenever he needs to. The first time Guts saw this, he told Skull Knight to cut out the magic act, but it was the black swordsman whose jaw needed lifting after he witnessed what Skull Knight's magic sword can do. By refining the Behelets, Skull Knight had been able to harness their spatial powers, which allowed him to create a sword that can literally cut through space. Usually, the target of its slashes will end up in the abyss, and that is what the interiors of Behelets are linked to. But Skull Knight can adjust the effect to literally pop out of anywhere and attack anyone at any time. He saves Guts from being sucked into the astral world or overrun by astral monsters by cutting through space and escaping with him via another lair. He also manages to ambush Griffith atop Ganeshka's head in the latter's Shiva form by cutting open a portal so unexpectedly even Zod couldn't respond to it. The only reason the sword even works is because Skull Knight understood the nature of Behelets, and decided to reshape them in this way using his own anatomy. So we have to give him some credit for that. And given that the Sword of Actuation actually delivers on what it promises, we have to put it up for consideration as the only weapon that can feasibly defeat the God Hand. But the problem here is, Skull Knight already tried using it to kill Femto once, and he ended up causing the great roar of the astral world instead. While the Sword of Actuation gives him an unprecedented edge over any other kind of entity against the God Hand, it seems to be a no-sum game. This is because not only did Femto dodge the attack, he anticipated it, knew what was going to happen down to the last detail, and manipulated it in accordance with Causality's wishes. So no, while the Sword of Actuation might be a weapon designed to seal away the God Hand, it actually accomplishing that seems a bit far-fetched right now. For that to happen, someone outside the thousand-year loop of Griffith's story needs to do it, and sadly, that's not going to be the Wandering Wraithster.
Marvelous verdict. One question we see pop up on fan forums is whether Guts will end up becoming exactly like Skull Knight in his pursuit of revenge. And while we can see why people would think that this is a good idea, it would defeat the entire purpose with which Berserk has been written in the first place. Guts' story is about the human struggle against inhuman circumstances, and how the human can withstand insane amounts of abuse and still come out shining brighter than a star. Guts becoming more than a sacrifice to astral beings would defeat the entire purpose of his art, which is why we don't think he'll end up a spirit in a steel cage like his fellow struggler here. As for Skull Knight himself, every frustrated soul walking the earth is bound to find its way to the other side at some point, and that's how we see his story ending too. The fact that he's already a spirit from an anatomical perspective should make things easier for him, but if his life is proof of anything, it's that grudges can outlive the weight of centuries. But that's enough philosophical romanticizing from us. What did you guys think of this video? Let us know in the comments down below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more Berserk content, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Until then, keep on struggling, strugglers.